My name is Lin Fei Wu. Uh, I'm a RISIS member and I'm leading a team uh, inside IP research for working on the uh, graph for AI. So uh, today I'm going to talk about um, a relative new technique called the deep learning or graph. And uh, so we will first introduce the, uh, the basic models and why we care about uh, the deep learning on graph. And then we'll talk about some advanced application, for example, in natural language processing and computer vision. I'm very fortunate to work with all these excellent researchers, and without them, uh, this work cannot be done. So why we care about graph? Graph essentially is a generic language that can describe and modeling complex system. So as you show in the right hand side, so you know, graph is a very simple structure. You have some node to delete some for some, some object. Okay, and you have some edge to describe the relationship between uh, two node. So let's take a look at uh, a real example. So imagine this as a teacher student graph, maybe come from some a real AI plus education domain. So some node is uh, related to the teacher, and the teacher can have its own uh, attribute. For example, teacher can, you know, what kind of classes the teacher are teaching, and uh, what's the relative ranking of this teacher. So all this information essentially formulates as attribute for this node. Same as Zidin here, so Zidin also has its own attribute. So when we talk about the deep learning graph, essentially we talk about the two kinds of inputs that we consider here. So we first consider graph topology that essentially can be represented as adjacent matrix or Laplace matrix, whatever you like. And also we will consider the attributes that are associated with node. Of course, the node type typically will associate as a kind of as a node label. Um, you know, without loose generality, typically we also consider a graph that also have edge attribute. But you know, in this talk, let's put it simple. We only consider graph topology and also node attribute. Okay, so graph structure really is everywhere. So from the internet to social network, naturally everything is represented in graph. Even in the financial domain, uh, for example, this network of the transaction essentially can be used for you know, performing the anti-money laundering uh, problem. So in the um, biology domain, uh, nowadays people tend to using uh, the deep learning on graph technique to try to model the graph, uh, the chemical compound as a graph, therefore that they can learn a distribution of these existing drugs and try to generate a new uh, drug that uh, hopefully that can deliver some uh, certain property so that we can find a new drug. So in the program analysis domain, you know, you can use you either use uh, like calling graph or data flow graph, try to analyze the, the program so that you know, you can uh, learn uh, very insightful uh, information regard, uh, regarding a program. So even in the computer, do, computer vision domain, so you know, we all know that convolutional neural networks have been already very successful for like object detection. However, if we want to you know, know the activity that uh, going on inside the image, so it's better to modeling the each object and also the relationship between the object. Therefore, that we can do some sort of a reasoning over the uh, image. So um, today, uh, you know, before the uh, deep learning on graph, so machine learning graph you know, have been a long-standing um, problem. So classically, so people have been working on the node qualification. Essentially, you know, once you have an embedding for the node, you can predict the type of the given node. And you can also do the link prediction so that you can predict if two nodes are linked or not. So the committee detection really is about how to classify or, or try to cluster in a, a subtype, uh, a small cluster of the node that they behave similarly. Graph matching really about how to you know, compare two graphs, are they similar or not? So uh, with rising the deep learning, uh, today people are focused on how to you know, apply deep learning technique on the graph. So there are quite a few applications people tend to uh, address. But the graph clarification definitely is one of the most popular ones that you try to give in a graph, try to predict you know, a type for the whole graph. Uh, so uh, graph generation, you know, is also very very uh, important uh, branch because you know, 
For example, in the drug discovery, as, as I mentioned before, people tend to you know learn that you're using uh, graph structure your data so that uh, they can you know learn that you learning the distribution and try to generate a new sample that hopefully it can carry some uh, certain property. Graph structure learning essentially is uh, try to it's a very new domain. It essentially, try to uh, address the problem that you know most of the graph is uh, not uh, perfect. It's either noisy or incomplete. So in this case, how can we you know uh, jointly learn the graph structure and the graph embedding at the same time? So uh, finally, it's you know more related to today's talk is graph to X learning. So you can think about this is an auto encoder uh, framework that it takes the graph as input and the X as output. The X here could be sequence, could be tree, could be graph. So essentially here, um, you can think about a generalization of the sequence sequence model, but to the more complex, either from the input side or output side. Okay, now let's talk about uh, uh, some basic model in the deep learning on graph, so that you know we all in the same page. Then we look to talk about how can we leverage this power of the uh, uh, technique to solve the uh, real problem in the natural language processing and the computer vision. Okay, so the load calculation task essentially is try to define a function so that we can transform a node to the latent space, you know, essentially to learn its embedding. Once we learn the embedding, right, so we can predict, for example, in this task, we try to predict is this question mark node, are uh, they uh, carry the red color or blue color? So this is essentially a corresponding to node calculation task. In real world, right, so we people have been using this technique to try to classify the function of the protein in the interaction. Okay, so in the link protection task, essentially is once we learn the embedding for the two the node, so therefore that put them together, can we predict are they linked or not? So this is you know essentially a very important because in real application, essentially we try we have many applications that we try to do that. For example, in the recommendation system. We try to predict, you know, an uh, uh, item, you know, is linked to some user, so that we can recommend the right item to the right user. We all know that, you know, in the machine learning life cycle, uh, the most important part is feature learning. So before the deep learning, so you know, there are many techniques try to do the feature engineering. You know, essentially try to transform the raw data into a more uh, meaningful structure feature uh, matrix. So with the rise of deep learning, so we tend to use a neural network to automatically learn the feature. So that's become very, very important power of the deep learning. And therefore that later, once we learn a very meaningful uh, feature, we can you know, throw that uh, information to the learning model so that uh, we can solve the problem. In the um, feature learning graph, essentially we try to have the same goal here is try to design an efficient task independent or task dependent feature learning for the machine learning in graph. You know, um, conceptually, we try to define a function f that we can transform the node into its latent space, such as that it can represent as a vector. And this vector, you know, essentially is the distance in two nodes in this latent space. You know, if they are small, so that that can the similarity in the latent space can be approximate to the original similarity in the in the original graph in in in, in the uh, in the context. So in the graph neural essentially we want to learn the same thing. The key idea here is that we try to generate the node embedding based on the local uh, the local neighborhood information. So as shown in the left hand side, so A is our target node. So in order to learn the embedding for the A we tend to use in the context information, the neighborhood from B, C, D. Okay, and B is the neighborhood is N, C. So therefore that we can uniquely define a computational graph for each node so that we can uh, learn a representation for them. So the most, in, you know, the most important thing that, so, you know, I'll be showing here that, so let's, let's naturally define a computational, you know, uh, flow, right? So in the layer one, so, each of node have will have its own uh, initial attribute. So initial attribute typically may have carry very important information. Therefore, it's very important to take into account that, that information. And then you know in the in the lexicon layer, uh, we want to define you know an aggregation function so that we can aggregate the information from um, <coughs> the uh, last layer and then try to generate a new embedding for the current node. 
And then, you know, essentially we can see that the model itself could be an uh, arbitrary uh, depth, but in reality, it's, you know, uh, table is not that uh, deep because, uh, you know, we may have overfitting problem. Um, so then here, let's see an uh, overview of the GA model. So, you know, in first important part is how to define a, a neighborhood aggregation function because that essentially try to um, define a function that, you know, is very, very effective in the sense that can aggregate the information from the neighborhood so that we can capture the information for the current target node. And once we've done that, so we can, based on the problem we try to solve, right? So for example, if it's a node clarification problem, then here we can try to define a loss that try to you know, quantify the uh, load calculation um, accuracy. So then we can, you know, uh, using batch uh, training to train a set of the node um, so that uh, we can uh, learn the information. And finally, that we can generate the embedding, you know, for the node as we need it. It's worth noting that, so since we are, you know, working on to learn a application function, instead to learn an embedding for each individual node, therefore that even for the nodes that we never seen before, we can still, you know, uh, to generate an embedding for them using the aggregation functions that we have already learned. That's very important because, you know, in, re in reality, many applications that the graph could be changed, you know, uh, gradually or dynamically. So, you know, it, it lets no guarantee that, you know, in the testing phase, you know, the node have been taking into account is always have been seen before. So therefore, that is very important to have this kind of uh, uh, inductive learning setting. So here, let's give a case study. OK, so uh, let's assume that the aggregation function we're using here, we're using average uh, aggregation function. OK, so this is probably the most simple uh, function we can think about. So uh, essentially, we try to average the message from the neighborhood, and then we can you know, apply a neural network, try to define a loss, and then we can uh, compute the loss. So here is some mathematics behind, you know, this basic approach. So essentially, in the, you know, the proper uh, box here denotes the initial uh, node embedding for each of the node. As we mentioned before, so, you know, in many cases that, uh, so the node may carry important initial information that should be taken into account. That is one part of the information that we you know give an example at the very beginning in the graph teacher uh, graph um, graph. So in the uh, uh, red box, so here uh, this essentially is the average aggregation function that try to average the information from the, the embedding from the neighborhood and then you know, treat it as a kind of a message. And then we try to choose in this message with a uh, the uh, target node embedding from the previous iteration that it came as one. So that to put them together, we can apply a, you know, a nonlinear activation function and then we can generate an embedding for the target node V in the current iteration K. So you know, here is some quick summary about the graph network. So the key idea is very simple. It's just try to generate a node embedding by aggregating the label for the information. So there are two advantages here. First of all, you know, since we are learning aggregation functions, so it's allowing for the primary sharing in the encoder. So uh, because of that, so for that it's allowing for the inductive learning. So that is very, very important. As we mentioned before, the graph could change over time. So uh, as we know, since this is a very, very basic model, so of course we have many of the state of art uh, graph neural variant you know, in the literature. But uh, when we look at them carefully, we can see that some of the most important uh, distinction between the different uh, variant essentially is uh, how we define the aggregation function. How can we design an effective function that can aggregate the label for information? So, you know, some popular variant is uh, listed here. For example, the graph convolutional network and the graph attention network and the graph isomorphic uh, network. So if you have uh, you know, more interest, you know, you're welcome to read this paper and then to see, you know, how then the different aggregation functions differ from each other. Okay. Today, you know, uh, here I'm going to talk about uh, our first advanced uh, application here. So essentially, here we try to develop a model called the graph to sequence. So graph to sequence, you can think about as a generalization of the sequence sequence model. If we are familiar with the sequence sequence model, so here is the graph to sequence. We try to take a graph input and then uh, as a sequence output, so that we can learn a mapping between the graph input and the sequence output. 
So here we try to leverage our graphical sequence model and uh, within uh, reinforcement learning to question generation problem. So this is having been published in the IQ layer 20. So the question generation, you know, essentially is a uh, is try to generate a question giving an input passage and target answer. Uh, it's essentially the question answering, uh, question generation task is try to help the question answering task uh, because these two tasks are dual task. So uh, in many cases, you know, it may not have enough training data or the, it's very expensive to get allocated training data. Therefore, that is so how to use in some uh, advanced technique try to generate uh, you know a uh, high quality <coughs> the question answer period become a very important problem. So that's how we motivate the question uh, generation task. You know, the, in, in many real applications, for example, in the reading comprehension, so you know it, it try to generate you know a more high quality uh, question answer pair, or even in the visual uh, video question answering system, you know how to giving uh, image or video, we can generate a very good question so that uh, we can train a good uh, visual question answering system. In the dialogue system, it also have the same problem that you know sometimes we may not have enough user data. Therefore, that is very important to generate this high quality synthetic data so that we can train you know, a dialogue agent system. Okay, so you know uh, mathematically, uh, here's a more formal definition. So the input here is a text message and have a, and also have a target answer. So uh, our goal here is try to align the answer information and uh, a text message so that uh, we can generate a, a meaningful uh, question that can um, lead to this answer, given the current con context. OK, so they do have some uh, using safe art methods that uh, people have been proposed to solve this problem. So um, before the deep learning, people tend to use a template-based approach. This is a very uh, simple approach, but it's also very powerful if you have you know the domain very well. Essentially, you know, you try to rely on some heuristic rule or handcraft of template to generate you know, a question answer pair. Um, the problem with that is also it's have a, a very um, lower generalization capability because that if you switch in a different scenario or domain, you know, typically you cannot uh, leverage this uh, uh, template anymore. So uh, later people <coughs> have been derived uh, um, a sequence sequence model try to solve this problem. So uh, because uh, you can essentially treat uh, uh, the answer in uh, the uh, the content information and the answer information as a kind of a sequence and uh, the uh, the generated question as the output sequence. So therefore, that the sequence sequence model has been uh, using as a, a working horse for this uh, type of the problem. Um, the using work is uh, have been achieved a very promising result. However. Most of them fail to utilize the richer testing structure information beyond the simple word sequence. And sometimes you know, they highly uh, rely on the cross entropy uh, loss. So, however, you know, this may not be the best option because it cannot guarantee that the generated text is, is a synthetic and a semantic valid. And uh, sometimes we have to think about how to you know, effectively leverage the answer information. And that part is all very important. So here we summarize some long existing issue for uh, family issue for the long approaches. So that uh, um, the first issue really is about uh, they really fail to consider the global interaction between the answer and the context. And this has been a very, very important because you know without to consider both context and answer, it's very hard to generate a very meaningful uh, question. The second part is you know, they often uh, ignore the rich uh, hidden structure information uh, Beyond the word sequence, so that part is you know also very important. The third issue is that so uh, as we mentioned before, the cross entropy may not be the best option because uh, they often have this uh, explosion bias and inconsistency between the trend and test measurement. Therefore, that you know, how to generate the meaningful uh, question become very important. So the solution one is try to which propose called deep uh, alignment network that try to align the answer and. Uh, uh, the context so that we can incorporate the answer information um, into the context to generate a good question. The second solution is uh, we propose a novel graph sequence model that essentially try to treat <coughs> the input test sequence as a graph 
<coughs> so that we can consider the hidden structure formation in sequence. Finally, the solution three is try to uh, propose, uh, we try to propose a novel um, uniform learning loss to incorporate, uh, um, uh, to enforce the syntactic and semantic coherence of the generic uh, uh, text. Okay, so here is our um, reinforced learning based graph sequence model for question uh, generation. So we can see that so we have three um, different uh, key components. So first component, the deep alignment network. So that is essentially it's, uh, we pass the passage and the answer to there. So that's how we incorporate the answer information into passage. And once I have that, so it's very important to construct a graph that. Uh, um, so that later we can work on this graph. So this has been very, very important part that sometimes even is most important because, you know, if we construct a, a, a graph that with a lot of loyalty, you, you know, it's hard to get any good performance. Uh, we'll have a we'll have next slide where we'll detail talk about this uh, problem, how we have proposed a two different kind of approach to try to solve this problem. Uh, so once I to construct a graph, so then, then we can, um, we propose uh, this bi-directional graph encode, try to uh, split the incoming and outcoming information to treat them as a different graph. So that uh, just think about <coughs> the bi-OTM over the LTM, so that uh, we can um, better learn uh, information uh, regarding content information inside the graph. So once we generate another in <coughs> embedding for each of the graph, uh, <coughs> we then will apply a linear projection and uh, max pooling to generate a graph level embedding that essentially try to summarize the whole graph so that uh, we can uh, fit it as a context vector for the RN decoder. The RN decoder essentially will later will um, essentially will generate the, uh, the, the, the question text so that we can evaluate the quality of that. As we mentioned before, we have this uh, hybrid evaluator. So we have this course entropy evaluator, but at the same time, we also have this uh, reasonable learning based evaluator that try to guarantee the, um, the quality of the generated question that is a semantic and syntactic valid. Therefore, that uh, this, uh, both of them will serve as uh, uh, to generate uh, a hybrid reward so that we can uh, continue to improve the answer quality, uh, the question quality. So the first part is deep uh, answer alignment. So here uh, we try to um, using um, kind of a cross attention kind of a type of technique, try to align the answer information into the uh, passage so that we can incorporate this information uh, at the both word level and continuize the hidden state level. And so the second part essentially is about how to construct a graph. As we mentioned before, graph construction could be art, and but this is very important um, component. So there are two ways we have been proposed here. So the first way is try to uh, build a uh, called uh, synthetic based uh, um, static graph. Essentially, we try to leverage some um, domain knowledge to try to build a graph. For example, for a text sequence, you can always uh, try to use in kind of a, a synthetic parser to pass the information. Here we're showing that we can. Uh, using uh, the Stanford NLP tool to get a dependent path tree that essentially try to give us some uh, relationship between a pair of the word. And that essentially can be using to augment the kind of word sequence so that we can formulate this uh, synthetic based static graph. The second way, uh, you know, you know, synthetic graph is very important, and uh, if you have, if you are domain scientist, you know it very well. That's that's excellent to add that. However, um, you know, sometimes may not uh, the uh, domain scientist, so it's harder to know what kind of you know, hidden structure information you should use. So another way we have a proposed called the semantic and weird dynamic graph. So where you don't have to learn, uh, you don't have to really know any kind of uh, domain scientist information. Um, you know, this is a truly an uh, end to end system that we try to dynamic build a directly weighted graph that try to model the semantic uh, uh, relationship between the passing word. So, essentially, you know, as shown in this uh, uh, equation, the first step is really about uh, a self kind of a self attention technique, try to uh, generate a fully connected graph. But fully connected graph is always not the best option because uh, there are many you know, redundant or noisy information there. So later we'll try to specify that using KN graph. And once I have the KN graph, essentially that is much, much better representation for the 
the true uh, ground truth of the uh, graph so that uh, we can learn a semantic aware dynamic graph. So uh, once we have a graph, so we have to using a uh, effective uh, graph encoder try to encode the information. So for the different type of graph, for the synthetic basis state graph, we here we um, we generate the node aggregation function using mean aggregation vector, uh, mean aggregation function, uh, for the both incoming and outcoming um, uh, node embedding. And for the semantic one, because uh, the dynamic graph here is a weighted graph, so therefore that it makes sense to use a weighted average instead of using a mean average. Okay, so once we have this information, so next step is that, uh, so how can we do with this uh, um, uh, node embedding from a different direction? So one, you know, simple way to think about that, you can, you can you know, just like by STM over LTM, you can wait until final step, try to concatenate the uh, the embedding from the both direction and then put them together. Uh, however, we think that you know, not, this is not the best option. So we choose to uh, fusing the node in each intermediate um, uh, node embedding in the training uh, intermediate step. Therefore, that uh, we can immediately fuse in the information and then try to uh, incorporate this uh, uh, information during the training. So here is the fusing uh, uh, functions that have been designed and have been, uh, have been, have been shown that using this embedding, we can learn a very effective node embedding uh, for the final uh, um, task. So as we mentioned before, the hybrid evaluator is all very important. So here we have this mixed objective function uh, that combine both cross entropy laws and uh, reinforcement laws. So uh, one uh, particularly important thing is uh, we use this two-stage training strategy that we first train the model with cross-entropy loss and then we fine-tune the model by optimizing the mixed objective function. So here with some automatic evaluation result. So we have evaluated um, our um, proposed model, um, the Grotto S, uh, you know, both variant, dynamic and static, plus the bird and plus the reinforcement learning. And uh, compared with all these approach, we can see that for the different uh, the approach uh, split, we can all achieve state of art performance. Uh, this is it really demonstrates that it's very important to treat uh, to take into account the structure information and also uh, our, our reinforcement learning. So here's some uh, uh, more um, evaluation on the human evasion and ablation study. So the table two essentially show the human evasion. We can our we compare our approach compared to the ground truth and um, one of the baseline. So we can see that uh, so indeed uh, for the synthetic and the semantic information, our approach can uh, achieve better result and close, more close to the ground truth. And uh, for the application study, uh, we also want to show that so it's, you know, uh, each component is really play important role there. So we can show that uh, so without Dan, so information, uh, the performance will drop a lot. So that means that our deep alignment network is really very effective. And for the the um, the reinforcement learning part, so we can see that it's all compared without reinforcement learning, it indeed improves the performance. Uh, but another biggest gain we can come from is really is using BERT as a pre-trained audit embedding. And also we also use a fine-tuned one, so that uh, this also gives us a slightly uh, benefit compared to the fixed one. Okay, so um, now let's uh, you know um, talk about how we can using this kind of a ground sequence model try to solve a new uh, computer vision task called the grounded video decryption. So uh, since this is a video, therefore that you know there must exist in some spatial temporal information. Therefore that we also have to you know think about how to incorporate the spatial temporal information into a ground sequence model. So the and the, what is a ground video description task? So essentially, the, the as shown in the right hand side, uh, the input is really about a video, and the output is a, a sentence that try to describe the content or the activity inside a video. So this is a very interesting problem, and uh, there have been a quite a bit of effort to try to address this problem. So essentially, the ground in the video description task is proposed uh, uh, by Facebook AI. Uh, in the CVPR 2019. So, however, they only consider self attention technique to try to you know, kind of build kind of a graph. But you know, self attention essentially gives us a fully dense graph, so therefore, kind of a lot noisy. And 
when they try to generate test, they using this uh, um, uh, uniform um, attention that try to attend uh, the proposal equally and individually. That is not really um, I most uh, um, that's effective to consider. It's one way to consider how to generate uh, the how to attend the important uh, ranging. So uh, similarly, there has some related work try to consider this uh, task as well, but. Uh, Again, either graph is noisy or they try to just use the single framework to model the whole video that essentially discard the spatial temporal uh, information. Um, so here is some summarized the, the issue from the existing approach. They often try to encode the region proposal independently and fail to consider the hidden structure information. That actually is quite important. Uh, but in a in a graph in the computer vision domain, so the hidden structure information is not that obvious, so we will talk about that later. So the second part is you see the issue is a self-attention based method that typically is will build the fully dense graph. That essentially is harder to handle the noisy and the, the may have the fake relationship. Uh, the issue three is that so they often uh, may ignore or overlook the structure feature, for example, spatial, temporal, and semantic information. So our proposed solution is try to first of all use graph sequence model to learning the relationship among the uh, ranging proposal, and this is uh, being uh, quite important factor to consider. The second one that so when you build a graph, so you know it's not uh, the best to consider a fully connected graph. So therefore, that you have to think about how to specify your graph, how to optimize the graph, and that's the one that we are proposing here using King graph construction and graph refinement to address this problem. And we also try to explore the spatial temporal information. Uh, specifically, we try to use this uh, uh, hierarchical attention mechanism try to focus on the different level of the semantics so that we can generate a more meaningful text. So here is some over framework of our architecture. So uh, once I have a video, uh, so a common practice, you try to use a fast IN, try fast RCN to generate uh, uh, the proposal information. And for each of the proposal, essentially, that will located in each of the different frame. A frame just like an image, so that uh, we can build this uh, uh, initial graph by consider uh, the relationship between the, each of the uh, proposal in the nearby frames. Uh, so, however, as we mentioned before, the initial graph may be noisy. So, in order to address this problem, so we tend to learn a implicit graph so that we can. Um, you know, kind of learn a delta for the initial graph so that we can um, put the few the information together to formulate a refined graph. And once I have that, so we can apply this hierarchical graph attention. The key idea here is try to uh, attend the first to attend the most important frame and then try to attend to the most important uh, proposal, region proposal, so that we can uh, using this uh, information to generate uh, the corresponding text token. So as we mentioned before, the graph construction has been very important here. So here we still you know, leverage, try to leverage the, the, the KM based kind of approach that without any actual knowledge, we try to build a KM graph. However, we here try to uh, build a, a simple assumption that so we only consider frame that is nearby so that we can limit it to the graph size that we try to build. Uh, so later, uh, so if we have this external knowledge, the information available, uh, then we try to build this uh, relational graph. Therefore, that we can replace the K algorithm with a relational classifier, try to uh, predict the edge between the different proposal. Okay, so as I mentioned before, the initial graph may be noisy and incomplete. So therefore, that we try to learn this implicit graph so that we can augment the initial graph. So here we try to now first treat the graph as a metric learning problem, and then we try to specify the uh, fully connected graph so that you know if the similarity score is smaller than a certain threshold, we will throw it away. And therefore, later we can combine the, uh, the initial graph and the learned graph so that we can learn the uh, optimized graph. So right now here, the lambda essentially is a hyperparameter to control how, um, how much we are going to um, trust for each of the uh, graph source. For example, if an initial graph is uh, in a very high quality, then the lambda will give a high weight. Otherwise, we will tend to lead on 
uh, the information that we learned uh, through the uh, graph learning part. So the hierarchical graph attention, you know, essentially play an important role for the test generation. So the key idea, as we mentioned before, is uh, you know at two level. First of all, we try to attend to the um, to the uh, frame level so that uh, we can select uh, what's the most relevant frame that uh, we should attend. And then once we select the most important uh, the frames, we want to know, you know, in the proposal level, so what's the most relevant proposal that uh, associated with current uh, uh, test token so that uh, we can leverage this hierarchical graph tension for the better test generation. So here's some automatic experimental uh, evaluation. So we compare our approach um, against uh, the three uh, state art method on the activity net uh, set. So the BCMS here is uh, standing for the blue four cider uh, meter and uh, slice. So we can see that so indeed, so uh, with our approach, we can achieve a consistently better performance than using the approach. Here are some uh, effect, here are some study regarding uh, how much a K, uh, how large a K we should choose. Is this sensitive or not? So we can see that you know uh, very interesting that so the the our framework is not really sensitive to the K a lot. So although 10 can achieve the best performance, but even though we select the 5 and 20, the performance still is very similar. So the application study here showing that so you know how important each component. For example, if we don't consider inertial graph, if we don't consider refined graph, or if we don't consider hierarchical attention, these three are most important part that we have considered in this paper. So we can see that without considering them, you know, the performance drop. So that's why that's you know can, can that is uh, demonstrates that uh, each component play an important role in the final performance. Okay, so that's pretty much about all the. Uh, message we try to deliver today. Uh, you know, a uh, take-home message here is a deep learning graph essentially is a fast and growing area today. So um, one thing we treat the graph, why is it so important? Because before the deep learning, you know, people tend to use all, have already developed all kind of a domain knowledge in each domain to solve the problem. Uh, when deep learning arises, you know, people tend to just use deep learning to solve the problem. However, you know, there are some missing part is that, you know, we should combine the domain knowledge and uh, the power of the deep learning so that we can leverage all the all the you know wisdom that we have been developed so far. Graph essentially you know, really give us a bridge, try to bridge this gap between these two parts so that uh, we can uh, using graph to combine all the domain information and then use the deep learning to learn the information from the graph. There are many ongoing research projects about the graph network. Uh, inside IBM we call it the graph for AI. So for example, we try to develop the scalable node embedding and graph level embedding. This is very important for the very large graph, especially in industry level of the graph. And uh, as we mentioned before, the graph structure learning is also important because you cannot assume the graph is, is, uh, uh, is perfect. So it's, you know, in reality, it's always noisy and incomplete. So how to learn the graph structure and the graph embedding at the same time is also become very important. A graph matching network is trying to See the similarity between two graphs. That is, uh, you know, have uh, many applications. For example, to do the alarm detection, all this stuff. And uh, in reality, the graph also change over time. So, how can we develop a dynamic incremental graph embedding? That is important. Otherwise, you have to learn the graph embedding for each of the graph lab every time. That's a very computational expensive. Uh, today, we have been introduced, uh, you know, two important application. One is for the question generation, one is for the ground video execution using the graph sequence model. We have been also developed a graph to tree and graph graph model that essentially try to learn a mapping between the structure input and structure output. And that is also have a lot of applications uh, in the natural learning processing and computer vision. Okay, here are some advertisement. So we are organizing a second international workshop on deep learning graph uh, method application in the joint with the KDD. So if you're interested in this topic, and you are welcome to submit your work and to attend our workshop. And that's all for my talk. I'm looking forward to answer your questions during the online session. Thank you. Bye-bye.